Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the philosopher Alex King. She's an associate professor at Simon Fraser University in Canada, and she focuses on ethics and aesthetics in her research. She also runs the blog Aesthetics for Birds, which we will discuss in this video. Today, we talk about the broader relevance of academic aesthetics in society and culture. We discuss a broad range of subjects, starting from a certain fake woke um, Netflix show, but also moving on to multiracial identity, racial fetishes, um, but also more specialized topics in aesthetics, such as the aesthetic attitude, disinterestedness, and the emerging field of urban aesthetics. I have linked Alex's website, her blog, and some reading material in the description, and I hope you really enjoy it. If you're new around here, what I aim to do is to present research in humanities in a way that's accessible and interesting to the general public. So if you want to support this endeavor, you could like this video or subscribe to the channel. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy. Bye. Hi, Alex. Thanks so much Hi. for joining us. It's really cool that I get to talk to you like this on Zoom. Um, I've been reading your work and I'm really in, interested in your thoughts on some of these questions that I have. Um, so I first got to know you through your blog, um, Aesthetics for Birds. You run this blog and it is meant to bring together people who work on aesthetics and in the arts, like both in the academy and in the, in the art world. Uh, but the motto of the blog is a quote by the artist, Barnett Newman, aesthetics is for the artist as ornithology is for the birds. And this sounds like a really like self-deprecatory motto for an aesthetics blog, as if artists like, couldn't care less for the work in aesthetics, the academic research in aesthetics, just like birds couldn't care less about the science of birds. Um, so what is the idea of using this photo? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, one thing I should say right off the bat is I didn't pick that. So I didn't found the blog. So I, I can't speculate about the actual founders, um, reasons for picking that, but I have some thoughts myself, um, if you're curious. So, uh, I mean, one thing is, I think the quote is not actually meant to be taken completely seriously. Like he, you know, he says a lot of, the, artists say lots of things, but like Barnett Newman in particular says, you know, has a lot of these cute little like bon mots. Like he, I think he says like a sculpture is the thing you bump into when you're trying to get a better look at a painting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he doesn't literally think that's the definition of like what a sculpture is, right? Um, so I think that there's a, a, like a kind of cheekiness to the quote, to the mm -hmm. motto that we use. Um, so I think that like sort of co-opting that is like a little bit of a cheeky, move in response mm -hmm. um but also i think there's something kind of there are a bunch of different ways to read the quote which i think is kind of interesting so um one way is thinking of aesthetics as like aesthetic theory and another way is thinking of aesthetics as like just the actual look of the thing so you may think, well, aesthetics as the sort of formal surface qualities of the thing mm -hmm. isn't relevant for an artist. You know, it's, if you think about like mm -hmm. a conceptual artist or something like that, you know, maybe the beauty and the aesthetic qualities of the thing are not that important, or maybe that's what Newman is trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two sort of already two different readings of the word aesthetics in there. Um, and I think there's an actually a kind of other way to read um, the way he says, like, ornithology is for the birds and aesthetics is for the artist. Um, and you might, you know, the I think the obvious interpretation is the one you gave where you say, like, well, 
birds don't care about ornithology. They just do their thing. Um, but you might think like ornithology is for the birds in the sense that like ornithology is a thing we do sort of for their sake and to understand them better. And right it's like right. does that make sense yeah and so you might think like aesthetics is for the artist in the sense that like it's sort of for their sake it's because we're so interested in what they're doing that we sort of do this thing for them um to understand them better and that kind of thing um like if it weren't for them we wouldn't do it well that's um, a really beautiful interpretation of what we're doing kind of something like yeah. like a work of love for, for the art. Yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. A kind of almost like a kind of homage or like a sort of working through of like, wow, this stuff is so inspiring. And it's like, so we're doing this thing, we're engaged in this project to try to like figure it out and puzzle it out. <laughs> yeah, wow, okay, thanks. That's a really new perspective on this. Um, um, and, and the blog's content is geared towards general audiences. And yeah. obviously you believe that aesthetics is of broad social relevance. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of in stark contrast with the style of most academic specialized papers, which are often quite opaque to the average person. Um, so what do you think is, what are some of the most valuable insights you think that academic uh, aesthetics has to offer? for the proverbial person on the street? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great question. I think there's there's so many things that it's hard to just narrow it down to a few. And it really depends on like what the partic what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for somebody who's interested in like architecture or urban design or things like that, we'll talk some about that uh, hopefully in a little bit, but mm -hmm you know, for them, the insights of mm -hmm. academic aesthetics that would be useful or most interesting to them will be different mm -hmm. um, than someone who's really interested in music, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but that said, I guess I was trying to think of things that, like, I was framing this as like, what do I try to impart to my students when I'm teaching, like, an introduction to aesthetics? Like, what do I try to get them to see um, and I guess, I mean, anything I say is going to be slightly controversial, but I'm going to give like my top three takeaways. <laughs> okay. Um, give it so time. one is representationalism is one among many views or like one among many movements. I think that a lot of sort of, as you said, the kind of person on the street mm -hmm. has this view of art and aesthetics that's like, realism well it's sort of representation or bust right like this kind of mimesis view where mm -hmm. good art is just art that is most accurately representational mm -hmm. um and I think that one of the things that academic aesthetics can do and you know I try to do when I teach this stuff is get students to see that there's actually a lot more going on there mm -hmm. than just like how good are you at painting a landscape or something like that and getting every detail exactly right yeah exactly and like this the, the sort of skill of perspective and lighting and that sort of stuff yeah 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 the craft exactly um so that's one uh another one for me is this is this is the most controversial one on my list i think um is that it's not all totally subjective mm -hmm. um and i think the thing that I really try to get people to see when I, the, the sort of person on the street or like person in my class yeah. to see is that they don't even think that it's all totally subjective. Like they might say that, but they don't actually really think that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like when we engage in, in conversations about art or aesthetic matters, mm -hmm. we often like give people reasons for why we think what we think. And we like try to convince them. We think that convincing other people is possible. And if it were just totally subjective, that kind of stuff wouldn't really make sense, mm -hmm. right? We're like, oh, but like, look at this. Or like you read criticism or you read movie reviews and things like that. And you know, that all of that stuff is sort of premised on like, there's something that's not just totally radically subjective about it. Mm 
Yeah, yeah. I think it was either Kant or Hegel who said like aesthetic disagreement is a reason to end friendships. And that is the reason <laughs> for morality of aesthetic judgment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of second one. And then the last one is um, thinking about aesthetics beyond art, beyond like fine art. So the last sort of lesson is like aesthetic experiences are everywhere. Yeah. Um, like you know, that. it's like, you talk about urban aesthetics. It's like, we move through spaces mm -hmm. and that's, that's always going to come along with a variety of like rich and even like aesthetic experiences that we don't totally recognize as such, but they're just always very present, right? Like it's a very different aesthetic experience mm -hmm. to talk to someone over Zoom than to talk to someone in person or like in a real classroom or conference or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's the last one is like aesthetic experiences are all over the place. They're everywhere. They're when, we, you know, we have them when we eat, we have them when we watch TV. We don't just have them. It's not like a thing that's just for museums and galleries. Oh, in framed. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's not just stuff that's bound by the frames. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Like I like a lot of the Yuriko Saito's work, Yuriko Saito's work on, on this and everyday aesthetics and the familiar like yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Just the way that we experience, yeah, yeah. yeah like packaging or mm. like graphic design, all sorts of stuff like that, everyday objects. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, 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 and you, that's often the topic of your, of your blog entries as well at um, Aesthetics. Yeah. It's, you take pop culture, you take, for instance, Netflix show, the chair and you analyze it um and i really appreciate your argument that it's one of your later latest um entries mm -hmm. you say that um the show tries really hard to kind of display uh this wokeness but it is actually ultimately a very shallow wokeness and i really like like how you argued for it so maybe like for the sake of our audiences you could um say a little bit on that topic Ah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, the thing that struck me about this, I'll just say a little bit of autobiographical detail. I watched this show because everybody was talking about it in like academia, you know, everyone's just like, oh, have you seen this? Oh, have you seen this? Whatever. Twitter. And yeah. And uh, yeah. so I was watching it and I just really didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. And I was surprised that so many people that I had talked to did seem to really like it. Yeah. And so a lot of the post was sort of me trying to like put my finger exactly on what was frustrating about it for me. Mm -hmm. um, and like, so to, to the argument, I guess, if anyone hasn't seen it there, I can't really explain it without giving spoilers. So I don't know <laughs> if you I haven't seen it, maybe fast forward a little. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, for those of you who have seen it or who, are not bothered by the spoilers. <laughs> um, the, there's like a lot of representational diversity in the cast mm -hmm. and even in the like main characters in the cast. So the protagonist is played by Sandra Oh. So it's supposed to be this Korean American woman. She's the titular chair. Mm -hmm. um, and she has adopted a Mexican daughter who's named Juju. And she, one of her colleagues, a junior colleague, so pre-tenure colleague, is um, a Black woman named Yaz. Mm -hmm. So they really try very hard to like center these <laughs> narratives. Hmm? To, yeah, to represent diversity. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. They really tried hard to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think the way they did it was pretty clunky. Mm -hmm. um, like the way that this was executed was pretty clunky. And so, for example, um, like the daughter, mm -hmm. the only person that this daughter loves is like the white guy the one white guy in the show it's like the white guy in the show yeah exactly and it's so bizarre it's like she 
has like a really fraught relationship with mm-hmm. um, Sandra O's oh character. Mm-hmm. She like doesn't, she has like a very complicated relationship with her grandfather, with mm-hmm. um, Ji Yoon, that's Sandra O's oh character's name, um, with Ji Yoon's father who lives with them. Mm-hmm. She has a really complicated relationship with him. But, like, she just loves Bill. She's, like, always talking about, like, oh, can Bill, this, like, random white guy in her life, can he, like, come with us and do these things? Can he come over? Can he, you know, like, oh, he wants to, he wants to, like, do this dinner thing with us. Yeah, that sounds great. Right? It's just, like, very strange um, that she really latches onto him. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's, so turning to the, like, junior Black woman who Jiyun works with um there's a whole plot line that's surrounding the ten the t- sort of tenure review drama for her and it's like she's super progressive both pedagogically and sort of intellectually and the there's like this kind of again this old white guy foil for her Mm-hmm. And you sort of see them pitted against each other in um, their kind of like ideologies, both in terms of like their research and in terms of their pedagogy. Mm-hmm. And you're like really made by the show to sympathize with the white guy, with like the old, you know, nearing retirement white guy rather than with the young black woman. Mm-hmm. And I, it's like, I think the show does a lot of this, like it tells you to sympathize with the like POC characters Mm -hmm. then it makes it like gives you the feelings it like shows you why you should sympathize with the non-POC characters right it does a lot of this like it tells you to feel this way but then it makes you feel this other way and I think that that's the thing that sort of ultimately I find very fraught about it so like the for example the um undergraduates also who are represented as like a really diverse student body. Mm -hmm. They're just presented as these kind of like woke police uh, who have sort of like no sense of the subtleties and complications of like upper level administration. Because also why should they? But it's because again, it's portrayed in this way that just makes them seem very like petty or uncharitable or unreasonable. It just makes them as a diverse group mm-hmm. sort of like flat, mm-hmm. like a mob. right? It doesn't, it doesn't help you sympathize with yeah. them. It doesn't, it's like, oh, but they have a good point because some of the things they're saying are true. The show actually sort of, you know, skewers them mm-hmm. in a way and vindicates the kind of like, you know, the Dean or the establishment. Yeah, the the one who's being cancelled, kind of. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Vindicate the people who are trying to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Bill and the administration. Like that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. it's it's just a really in, was it kind of interesting to see, like, the I guess to the point of like. We don't just say opinions about things. We say thing. We say our opinions, and then we try to give reasons for them. Yeah. These are sort of like some of the reasons that I found yeah. the chair just it 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 was like very promising, but it just didn't make good on that promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could like I felt it was a bit flat, but it was only after I read your your blog entry that like I understood really like okay why. So really yeah. Funny. Yeah. yeah yeah and I think I mean I'm glad to hear that I feel like that's what good criticism does when I read it also is like you sort of have a sense or like an inkling and then you read something you're like oh it just like really snaps into focus Later. in a way that's really illuminating exactly yeah, yeah. The, the reasons why yeah yeah exactly yeah and um the I mean, it's diversity and um, inter- like racial identity. It's obviously a huge topic, right? And you also wrote 
quite a lot on, on this, but you were also interviewed on the topic of interracial identity. Yeah. Um, and I read one of the interviews and say it's, it's, it's kind of strange to always be treated like a curiosity, right? And this is kind of also like the ambivalence of aesthetic value because there's often kind of this idea that interracial people are especially beautiful and women are anyway always being ascribed, kind of always a lot, often spoken about in aesthetic terms kind of as an object, like a beautiful sight, a beautiful, um, right? And then like, um, so, and then this combination, intersectional, combina intersectional, sectorial combination with, with race, like when you're half Asian even, and then there's all this kind of fantasies surrounding like exoticism or orientalizing ideas of like submission and um, eroticism. So this is um, kind of this really, I would say, ambivalent way in which aesthetic, aesthetic values is being ascribed in the everyday. Do you think there's a, a need to kind of, um, to, to, to intersect ethics with aesthetics in this case and to kind of argue how ascribing aesthetic value to someone can be wrong or can be done in a, in a hurtful way? Definitely, I think that's a great question. I mean, so yeah, I, as you alluded, I'm half Asian. And one of the things that I've thought a fair amount, especially in the last few years about is kind of how that affects my sense of self moving through academic spaces, which are predominantly white. Um, and, you know, even growing up predominantly surrounded by predominantly white people where I was. Um, and I think the the kind of aesthetic value question that you raise is really interesting. And I guess, I mean, it's tricky and I don't know exactly what I want to say. One thing is, I think there's a, an important potential difference between like how people think of sexual preference mm -hmm. versus aesthetic value. So I think that people um, think of sexual preference as like really like a bare preference. Like it's, it's really sort of unassailable. And there are a bunch of people calling that kind of thing into question mm -hmm. um, in like work on, you know, ethics and race and discrimination and systemic issues and that sort of stuff. Um, but then there's a kind of question of aesthetic value which is, I think, slightly different, right? You might have, I mean, people have sexual preferences for things that they, I think upon reflection would distinguish from aesthetic value, right? You might think that, right? Like some people are attracted to things and they're like, I don't know, I don't, it's not that I think it's beautiful. I just am like really turned on by this kind of thing or whatever, right? Um, <laughs> so that's one, one aspect of it. Um, but regardless of that, there is a way in which, like, I think most people sort of blur those together, mm -hmm. right, in, like, common thinking. So I think that really, like, being complimented, and this is kind of what you're suggesting, being complimented on your appearance as, as a woman, but also, especially, I think, as a woman of color of any kind, and I think this because of all of the like Orientalism stuff and exoticism, this is particularly salient for Asian and Asian American women. Um, it's just a kind of like poison chalice, right? It's like, if you accept it, you're sort of accepting a package of things, mm -hmm. many of which you don't want to accept. You're like, oh, I've, I'm, it's like, I'm glad that you find me beautiful, but also, I don't know, I don't want you to think that I'm thereby submissive or that I'm thereby weak or that I'm thereby like going to like help you manage your shit or whatever, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, there's just all of these stereotypes that come along with that mm -hmm. that are pretty terrible, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, right? And that I'm not gonna like voice my opinion and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I, I think it's kind of like, um, it's, I think it's maybe a hard thing for people to understand, but it's like, 
you know, it's not always good to be thought of as like the smartest person in the room because that comes along with a bunch of associations. Like people might also think that you're like physically weak or that you're um, like not very social or that you're like awkward, that you're unattractive or whatever, right? There's like, if you're good in this one dimension, you have to sort of mm. fall along all these other things. Yeah. And same way, it's like, if you if people think you're like the strongest person in the room, they might think you're dumb. Right. If you work out all the time or you must be dumb, you're just a like dumb jock or whatever. Like people have these stereotypes right, right. that are not particularly nuanced. And I think that this is just like a particularly systemic version of that. And so it's like complicated in those ways. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But I also think there's, there is some work on this and on related issues. So there's some work on this kind of stuff um, mm -hmm. with people who do body aesthetics, okay. um, like aesthetics of the body and like ideals of beauty and like ideals of physical beauty and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of interesting work there. And there's a paper, if anyone's interested in this particular issue um, mm -hmm. that you're asking about, a uh, recent paper by Robin Jung, Z-H-E-N-G, um, called Why Yellow Fever Isn't Flattering. It's a great paper that, you know, even if you don't agree with the view in the paper, the paper summarizes a bunch of different issues that are going on in that kind of space. So mm -hmm. yeah, Thanks. definitely Thanks. recommend it if you're curious. Yeah, yeah, but I, I guess the kind of like, um, the kind of attention one might get kind of as, um, as half Asian, for instance, is probably not, yeah, you know, as you say, it's not really an aesthetic attitude. It's more like maybe some, like a very crude beginning because this, whole dimension of disinterestedness is lacking for instance because oh, right right kind of like an object of some fantasy the person has right Which yeah 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 really constructed as well right yeah yeah so, yeah definitely I have to formulate this question a bit more carefully yeah. than I have but it's something I will think about in the future like yeah how... yeah no I think that's right I think that's right that you know, I think that many people will not see that as a kind of many like philosophers and people yeah. working in aesthetics will not see that as an aesthetic attitude. But again, I think that most like people on the street don't make those kinds of subtle right, distinctions. Right, 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 right. right. And so for them, it really is sort of like a blurred together in a way that yeah, there, it's like there's a kind of innocence to hide behind. They're like, all I'm saying is like, I just find, I just really think beautiful. people who look like this are really beautiful. Right, 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 right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. but your own research is is especially on like the aesthetic attitude. So I'm really curious about talking some more about that. So you explain very clearly that it's a manner of attending to an object in a specific way. And it's exactly not the same as just finding it beautiful. And this reminded me of Wittgenstein's lectures on aesthetics from the 30s, where he also says stuff like, the point of aesthetics is not just gaping at something and saying, wow, or how marvelous or how beautiful. It's, it's a very nuanced quality of attention and it requires some knowledge and some thought. Um, would you like to elaborate a bit about your own, about your own theory of the aesthetic attitude? Yeah, so, I mean, one thing to say is, although I've written about the aesthetic attitude, I'm, like, interested in the view, mm -hmm. but I don't myself endorse it. I actually really dislike disinterest-focused theories, um, but, I mean, part of, it's like a kind of know your enemies thing, right? It's like I'm interested in it because I think it's wrong, but I think it's kind of interestingly wrong, Okay. Um, and it, you know, we can learn a bunch of things from the ways in which it goes wrong. So, I mean, the, the idea of the aesthetic attitude is just roughly speaking, like it's a way that you attend to things mm 
mm-hmm. that sort of ma- like nothing in itself is an aesthetic object versus not. It's just a way that you attend to things that makes that sort of brings out their aesthetic features or makes their aesthetic features salient to you. So, you know, I could take the aesthetic attitude towards a painting. That's sort of the default attitude Mm -hmm. that you're meant to take towards a painting. A non-aesthetic attitude you might take towards a painting is like thinking about it as um, a piece of investment just like a financial investment and then you're not taking the aesthetic attitude towards it but the normal attitude you think of taking towards a painting is Mm -hmm. probably pretty close to what people mean by the aesthetic attitude it's kind of like taking the thing on its own terms Mm -hmm. typically it means with respect to its formal qualities but not exclusively um like some people think that it you know you can fold in things like historical um features, maybe even intentional stuff and other, you know, context things that might be relevant. Um, But it's sort of like taking the object uh, like um, in its own right or as itself or something like that. Um, But I could also take the aesthetic attitude towards like a tree and just like observe it as though it were almost like a piece of sculpture. Yeah. Right. And like, oh, like the way that this branch looks is like particularly elegant. This branch is kind of, you know, imbalanced in this compositional way or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or I might do it for any number of things around me. I might do it for a person, for a body. I might do it for a chair. I might do it for uh you know, font or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of that is sort of to take those things, to take that kind of way that you would look at the painting and look at things in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and you don't agree that this is um, central to aesthetics? No, I mean, I think that it's, or like it's um, centrality has been overstated. I think that's the most diplomatic way for me to put my view. (laughs) Um, Because I think that in the history of aesthetics and the history of philosophy of art, people focus a lot on fine arts um, at the cost of other arts. And I know that that's something that you're also very interested in. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Cool. So so what would you think would be more important than than taking this special um, attitude that you reserve for fine art? to um, aesthetics or the aesthetic value? So I think that like for some things, I mean, I think it's really clear in some cases that it's hard to separate um, an aesthetic evaluation of something from things that are sort of characteristically supposed to be separate from the aesthetic attitude. So Right. Like if you think about, I think function is a great example of this. So, you know, to talk about like urban aesthetics or like industrial design or things like that. Right. It's like, if I look at this cup, I mean, part of my aesthetic evaluation just, it seems like it sort of folds in Mm -hmm. functional concepts. Like, it's supposed to hold things. If there's a hole, if there's, if the, you know, cup is designed Mm -hmm. so that there's a hole in the bottom of it Mm -hmm. where the the liquid can pour out, it seems like the aesthetic evaluation of that has to change in part because like the kind of thing that it is maybe is slightly different. Maybe it's like a sculpture and not an, not a cup. Right. So it seems like the functional stuff is really like embedded Mm -hmm. in our aesthetic evaluations in a way that's really hard to just like cleanly separate out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually probably the function of museums to try to kind of cleanly separate out and just display artworks. But as you say, that's really not everything. And there's all this whole dimension of aesthetics. Um, Right. And that's why I myself find like design museums really interesting Mm -hmm. because I just find it really interesting how this stuff is presented yeah. And how the, you know, like what the labels say and whether they give you context or whether they draw your attention to formal qualities or, you know, like I just find that whole kind of museum space very interesting in this way. Yeah, like, like a museum of chair design where you're not allowed to. Yeah, exactly, it, but... exactly. Yeah. 
look at them. It's really funny. <laughs> ah, right, right. Where you might think like a really good museum of chair design would also have like samples for you to sit on because that's also surely part of the aesthetic experience of the chair. It's this pushiness kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah. Or in urban design, that's my field. Um, this kind of idea of function or involvement is, or engagement is also very central. Um, and I think, I mean, there's some ways in which you can look at urban aesthetics uh, through the lens of disinterestedness. For instance, in this tradition of Flannery we have here in, in Europe, it was very prominent in the late 19th, early 20th century, where these flaneurs, strollers, people who would like stroll through the city, they kind of protested this acceleration of life in modernity. And they would very leisurely walk through the city without any specific purpose. And sometimes they would even like have a turtle on a leash just to really demonstrate how slow they're taking it, the slowness of their pace. And, um, and there's a quote from a, a, a German writer that describes this idea of Flannery. He says, Flannery is a kind of a reading of the street in which human faces, shop fronts, shop windows, cafe terraces, streetcars, automobiles, and trees become a wealth of equally valid letters of the alphabet that together result in words, sentences, and pages of an ever new book. In order to engage in Flannery, one must not have anything too definite in mind. So that's exactly this idea of disinterestedness. You, you walk through the city, not because you want to shop or go somewhere, but because you're just enjoying it leisurely walking through the city and looking at it like, like a book, like reading the signs and stuff. But on the other hand, I would say that perceiving the city and the aesthetic evaluation of the city always involves a political dimension. Just the motion of the body through neighborhoods, the sensing like when you perceive the commodities and signs the kind of designed to lure you in, capture your attention, the scale and affordances of the city designed with the male body in mind. Um, you cannot really be disinterested if you perceive all of that. You're involved, you, you, you're in relation to all these influences. And of course, this was important to people like Walter Benjamin, who was one of the most famous planners. He did not look at the city like abstract shapes and forms and beautiful um, colors, but he was precisely very interested in deciphering kind of this politics of commodification and modernity. Um, do you, how would you characterize the role of disinterestedness or on the opposite side, engagement in urban aesthetics? Do you think that this practice of flannery of strolling leisurely through the city involves two differing attitudes to the city, like the aesthetic attitude and then the political attitude? I guess not because what you just said is that it's connected, right? Or would you say that yeah. you know, politicize aesthetics to, to really consciously also put this um, other aspect into aesthetics? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't know the thing. I I am sort of aware of the like Flannery kind of, mm -hmm like movement I guess mm -hmm. but I didn't know the turtle fact that's just particularly great that's just I just imagine people like like an Oscar Wilde strolling through the streets with a turtle and just the image of that is delightful <laughs> sure um, do that in a hurry. yeah 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 totally totally mm -hmm. um as someone who walks very fast on sidewalks I really appreciate the <laughs> the metaphor there, the kind of imagery. Um, but yeah, I think this is a really interesting case. Um, I think there's, it's almost a kind of disinterest that's like politically motivated, right? It's like disinterest as like a reaction to oh, yeah. all of the in like, normal interest um, overwrought patterns of engagement, right? Like the, obviously like everything, I mean, it's only more true today than it was at their time that everything is geared toward like, toward commodification and sale and, you know, the 
wheels of capitalism keep, you know, to keep all that moving. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's interesting that this, it's like a kind of disinterested attitude, but it seems to me kind of like motivated to be put in place by political considerations, Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, exactly how to characterize the attitude itself I think is a little bit, um, I'm not sure what I would say about like the attitude itself. If it's motivated politically, does that mean the attitude itself Mm -hmm. like has sort of political stuff in it or is it merely enough that it's sort of like politically aware, Mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, even it's even totally compatible with all the, you know, disinterest aesthetic attitude stuff that you could be aware of like the historical or the socio-political context of, you know, a Las Vegas strip sign Mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And in fact, you might think that that's important to understanding what's going on. Like, why is there an enormous pyramid there? Oh, because it's Las (laughs) Vegas and there's this history of, you know, postmodern, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Um, And so approaching that stuff with disinterest, even if it's like politically motivated, the attitude itself might still be purely disinterested. I think that to to be sure, I would would just actually be really curious to like hear more about the actual ways that people were perceiving and processing Mm -hmm. the sort of perceptual inputs and the things that they observed and experienced on these strolls. Yeah, yeah. It could also be read as a political act, kind of demonstratively. Oh, totally, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The kind yeah. of do by the taking, mm-hmm. yeah, taking the disinterested attitude as a kind of political act, like adopting that perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks, that's a really cool perspective. Um, so then I would just come to the, Final question. Would you say that your own practice of philosophical reflection on aesthetics has enhanced your everyday aesthetic experience? Um, you sent me this question. I was sort of like, uh, <laughs> it's almost like a laugh to keep from crying reaction that I had. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> basically, yes and no. Right, right. Um, like, yes, in that I think that I'm just like, because I'm very attentive Mm -hmm. now to aesthetic experiences and aesthetic um, qualities and things, I'm just much more sensitive Mm -hmm. to that kind of stuff. And that's part of like having rich aesthetic experiences is like Mm -hmm. being really sensitive and attuned. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a lot more knowledge Mm -hmm. about things that I'm interested in and, you know, theories that underlie the things that I'm interested in. Um, And I'm super curious. And I think all of those things are really important and really do genuinely enrich my everyday aesthetic experiences. But also, I mean, it's like, you know, if you work in TV production, it's hard to just watch a show. Or if you are like an editor, it's hard to just read something without like that part of your brain switching on that's like work or, you know, you sort of appraise, you're like so used to gearing into it as work. It's like so many times I have an aesthetic experience and then I'm like, how does my theory account for this, right? (laughs) Or like, what would I say about this? And it's like, sometimes it's just not the best frame of mind <laughs> right, right. like yeah so I mean I don't know do you have a, you must have that also I would think yeah sometimes it's just tiring to to analyze like what your experience you can't really experience it innocently innocently anymore right yeah right 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 like musicians who can't really listen to music on their off hours like they can't listen yeah. to music to relax because they're analyzing everything even if it's just like a silly jingle or something they're like yeah so that's yeah right or like there's all this stuff about like gourmet chefs who go home and eat instant ramen (laughs) because they're like I'm just surrounded by this stuff all the time I just need something that's you know like simple and over the top and just gonna give me you know yeah (laughs) you don't need subtlety anymore (laughs) (laughs) you're like I just have 
so much of this all the time. I just need a little bit of a little bit of change of pace. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. Thanks so much for this super illuminating and, and like inspiring talk. Um, um, I hope to to read more of your work on, on the blog and, and to see more of your interviews in the future and to meet sometime in person on some, some conference, hopefully. <laughs> yes, I hope so. I hope so. And thanks for inviting me. This has been really fun. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us. All the best to you and to your work. And yeah, thanks. Likewise. Time.